In this sequence of videos, I'm going to talk about the scope and lifetime of variables and parameters. I'll show you how to use local, global and static variables in visualbasic.net. And I'll show you how to pass parameters between subroutines and functions. I'll also be talking about some of the differences between value types and reference types and the implications these differences have for parameter passing. To help you understand the code you're going to see, I'll say something about what's going on behind the scenes in terms of memory. My examples are coded in VB.NET, but the fundamental principles are the same in other high-level programming languages. For the purposes of this discussion, I'll define a program as a collection of subroutines which cooperate to perform a particular task. A program that is currently running is known as a process. Control and data are passed from one subroutine to another while the program is running. There are two types of subroutine, subprocedures and functions. I'll be writing a lot of my code inside a VB.NET Windows Forms application. This means that most of my code will be written within a form class. Subroutines inside a class are more correctly known as methods. I'll say something about classes, objects and methods in these videos, but they are the subject of another sequence of videos if you want to find out more. Before demonstrating some code, I want to talk about how memory is organised for a typical process. By typical, I mean a process written in a typical high-level programming language, running on a typical computer with a typical operating system, if there's such a thing as typical. Now let me be absolutely clear. This is not a diagram of the computer's physical memory. It's how a single program sees the memory while it's running. It's the virtual address space of a single process. As far as any program is concerned, when it's running, it's the only thing running on the computer. Of course, that's rarely the case. At any one time, there are probably dozens of programs running on a typical computer. But the operating system works in conjunction with the hardware to map virtual memory onto physical memory, maintaining this illusion. If you could see what was really going on inside the physical memory, it would look like a jumbled mess. So, given that this is the perspective of a typical program running on a typical platform, let's talk about the way the memory is organised. Before it even starts running, the program code itself is allocated some memory. We call this the code area, because that's what it contains, the compiled program code. In .NET, this contains the native code instructions after they've been just-in-time compiled or jittered. The executable code can be allocated a fixed amount of memory because it's known in advance and it won't change. We say that the memory from the code area is statically allocated. Depending on the language, a fixed amount of space may then be allocated to any program data whose space requirements are known in advance. This includes space for any global constants, or any variables declared as static. The amount of space needed was calculated by the program's compiler, based on the data types of these variables and constants. This area of the virtual address space is labelled as static in this diagram, because once it's allocated, it won't change in size for the duration of the process. A static area is used by languages such as C, Java, Pascal and Python. You may see similar diagrams in which the static area is labelled data. In .NET, things are somewhat different, as you'll see later. The other two areas on this diagram are the ones that concern programmers most, the stack and the heap. These are dynamically allocated. Their size can't be known before the program starts, and their sizes can change at runtime. The stack and the heap are at opposite ends of the virtual address space, and they grow towards each other. This arrangement makes best use of the virtual address space. The stack is properly known as the call stack or the execution stack. When a subroutine starts running, it's automatically allocated some space on top of the stack. This is known as the subroutine's stack frame. When one subroutine calls another, a new stack frame is created 
for the one that has just become active. When a subroutine finishes, its stack frame is removed and control is returned to the caller. Each stack frame contains a subroutine's local variables and parameters. It also contains the return address of the subroutine that called it, so the caller can resume correctly later. The amount of space required by each stack frame was calculated when the program was compiled, based on the data types of the local variables and parameters of a subroutine. The size of the execution stack therefore depends on how many subroutines have been called in succession, and the size of each stack frame. The heap is used to store data whose size can't be known in advance, and data that might outlive the subroutine that created it. This includes the data belonging to array variables and instances of classes, namely objects. Some programming languages provide commands to allocate and deallocate space on the heap, but most modern programming languages will allocate space on the heap automatically. They include a garbage collector, which will automatically free up heap space when it's no longer being used. Access to the heap is slower than the stack because it requires more management by the operating system. If you explore this subject in more detail, you'll no doubt come across lots of other diagrams similar to this one, with more or less detail. The truth is, the exact layout of a program's virtual address space depends on the programming language, or to be more precise, its compiler, the operating system, and the machine architecture. For programs written in .NET languages like VB and c -sharp, the virtual address space of a process is managed by the common language runtime of the .NET framework. And the real picture is somewhat different to this. For example, a .NET process makes use of several heaps, each with its own purpose. Amongst others, these include a small object heap for objects up to 85 kilobytes in size, and a large object heap for objects over 85 kilobytes in size. So, although this picture is somewhat simplistic from the perspective of a .NET program, from the perspective of a .NET programmer, it's adequate, and it'll help to explain the behaviour of variables and parameters 